Thank you, Ben. Good morning and welcome to worship at Birding Salvation Army. It's great to see you all here this morning and a welcome to anyone who is joining us online via our live stream. We will be serving tea and coffee from the Welcome Inn after our worship this morning. Please do join us next door. Next Sunday, our worship at 10 a.m. will be led by Major David Botting. Um, the Colin Wilson All Stars Band and Choir CD is set to be released on the 7th of the 9th. So that's, is that this month? Next month, September. I don't know where I am, sorry. Uh, so they are priced at £10 and £2 postage and packaging. So please do come and have a look at the poster that I'll have. It will be going on our Facebook or also speak to Lillian. I'm sure she'll be willing to, to point you in the right direction. We are celebrating our cause 139th and befriending services 10th anniversary on the weekend of the 24th and 25th of September. On the Saturday, there will be a reception here, followed by afternoon tea. If you received a personal invite as someone linked to our befriending service, don't forget to let us know by the 14th of September whether or not you're planning to attend. If you have not received a personal invite, you will need a free ticket. This is to help us know how many people to cater for. Tickets will be available up until the 14th of September and are available today from Karen, I believe. If you take a ticket and then find you can't attend, please phone the whole office to let us know. And finally, um, someone's got a big birthday coming up. So it's Wynne Bonfield's 90th birthday on the 3rd of September. I know it's a little bit early, it's nearly a week early, but let's have a chorus of happy birthday, shall we? Happy birthday to you. Thank you, Luke, and congratulations, Wynn, on you're just about at the milestone. Let's watch a video as we come and remind ourselves that we are in God's presence. It's good to remind ourselves of what he does for us. I have seen the pace of your life. The stress. The anxiety. The constant movement, rushing from one place to the next, chasing after your desires, or running from your fears. I see how you struggle, striving to meet your needs all on your own. I see the burdens placed upon you, you place upon yourself. In the midst of this chaos and hurry, I am calling out to you to slow down. Be still and know that I am God. It is I who set the earth in motion. It is I who sustains you, protects you, and provides for your needs. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Trust in me with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. For I will never leave you. Let your soul find rest in me. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. For neither death nor life, the present nor the future, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from my love. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world.
In that video, various verses of scripture are woven together into this picture of what God does for us each day in his sustaining grace. And so in our first song, we're giving thanks for what God has given us in his word, all those reminders of who he is and what he does for us. If you're following in the Salvation Army songbook, this is number 804. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. Let's stand and we'll sing verses 1 and 2, please. shall not thee overflow, for I will be with thee thy trials to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. Words taken from Isaiah 43. Let's let those sink into our hearts as we sing the remaining three verses. Be seated. Now, whether we live on our own or whether we live with some other people, most of us have family, don't we? We don't necessarily see them very often. We might see some of them every day and others once in a blue moon. And some people may non- no longer be alive, but they are still part of our family. So there's mums and dads. Stepmums, stepdads, children, brothers, sisters, cousins, grandparents, great-grandparents, all sorts of people make up a family. Even the in-laws are part of your family, whatever you think about that. And of course, most of us, we share some genes with a G. In some families, maybe you share the genes with a J as well, but we'll not go into that. So... There's often a family likeness, aren't there? Physical traits sometimes get passed on from generation to generation and shared across as well. So I've got a photo this morning of three little girls and one person here, well, two people actually, are disqualified from speaking for the next minute or two and that's Bram and Major Lillian, okay? 
because I'm going to ask the rest of you if you think those three little girls are related. You think two are, okay. So which two are related? The ones on the left, yes. The two on the left, they are sisters. They're a lot bigger than that now. The one on the right is their cousin. And as they've grown up, she's started to look more and more like the one in the middle. So to the extent that once Bram mistook them one Christmas. Um, because we share DNA with people, we often have family physical traits, don't we? Some people, will, most people will tell me that I look a bit like my mum. It's very interesting when I had um, a Sunday school group and most of the children were of African or Caribbean heritage, they look at the nose and they all thought that I looked like my dad because I have my dad's nose. But the rest of my face looks more like my mum. And so in my family, one of the genes is about height. So I'm one of the shorter people of the right family. Yes, Tony's looking a bit surprised. My brothers are both taller than me. And um, that little girl on the right, she's probably at least my height now, and she's got a bit, bit to go yet. And on the nucky side of my family, it's not so much about height, okay? We'll just kind of gloss over that. But sometimes it's about skills, isn't it? Or behaviours, and you can spot when somebody's related to somebody else because they behave in the same way, or they're good at the same things. They might be good at sport, or they might be good at music. What we're going to be learning about today is about when Jesus died on the cross and made it possible for everybody to become part of God's family. Whatever, wherever they're from, whatever their background, we can all be part of God's family and become his children. And we're going to think about how we can learn to live at peace with one another within that family. So that's what we're going to celebrate in our next song. So if the children would like to stay in for this, it's number 875, if you're following in the book. And what I've asked is that the band start us off slowly and gradually get faster, but not so fast that it's, it's a struggle for those with dentures, okay? So we'll, we'll see how you go. You might like to stand, because it's quite lively, and um, we can try and keep time with clapping. the Lord now. So we'll work our way across, bringing our gifts forward. And then after we've given our offering, John Justice is going to come and read the Bible for us.
pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we can use the time um, every week to show how we can give the things back to you, our monetary gifts. Um, and we pray that we can use them, use these monies wisely. Amen. The Bible reading this morning is taken from the message and I'm reading Ephesians 2 verses 11 to 22. But don't take any of this for granted. It was only yesterday that you outsider, outsiders to God's ways had no idea of any of this, didn't know the first thing about the way God works, hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You knew nothing of that rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel, hadn't a clue about what God was doing in the world at large. Now, because of Christ dying that death, shedding that blood, you, who were once out of it altogether, are in on everything. The Messiah has made things up between us so that we're now together on this, both non-Jewish outsiders and Jewish insiders. He tore down the wall, wall we used to keep each other at a distance. He repealed the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and footnotes that it hindered more than it helped. Then he started over. Instead of continuing with two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everybody. Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace, and that was the end of the hostility. Christ came and preached peace to you outsiders, and peace to us insiders. He treated us as equals, and made us equals. Through him, we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. That's plain enough, isn't it? You no longer wandering exiles? This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anybody. God is building a new home. He's using us all irrespective of how we got here, in what he is building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation, and now he's using you 
fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. Thank you, John, for bringing that reading to us. And the message translation gives us a slightly different way of coming into that reading, and we'll come back to that later on. Now, we're going to sing a bit of a golden oldie song together now. It's number 877, if you're singing from the Army songbook. So I'm hoping that those who have been salvationists for a while, I can see from Arthur's face that you recognise this one. So the band are going to help us, and we'll sing the four verses straight through, please, Luke.
The six-month anniversary of the war in Ukraine has happened. An anniversary we hoped we wouldn't reach, isn't it? But I felt it was important that we pray specifically for the situation in Ukraine this morning. So I invite you to join me in prayer. God of all grace, amidst all that we don't understand, Surrounded by images and stories of violence and conflict, we stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and all who live in fear this day. Our prayers of lament are also prayers of empathy and prayers for a peaceful resolution, prayers for a world where there is no more war, no more suffering, no more needless death. This day and every day, grant us your peace. Today, Lord God, we are thankful that we here can pray in safety. As we pray, open our hearts to the plight of those who live in danger and fear. We pray for those who have fled their homes in Ukraine, those who have queued at borders and waited anxiously for a safe place to live. We pray for those fighting to protect their cities and homes and for those searching and grieving for loved ones. Lord, show us how to live as peacemakers this day and every day. Grant us your peace. Amen. Now I invite you to join in praying words that are going to come up on the screen. Holy God, bring comfort to those who grieve, safety to those who flee, hope to those who despair, peace to those caught up in conflict. Holy God, we hold before you this day the people of Ukraine, and we stand with them in their hour of need. We pray these prayers. Through the name of Jesus Christ, our Prince of Peace, who reigns forever. Amen. As we continue in prayer, we're going to turn to Song 338 in the Salvation Army Songbook, number 338. We invite Jesus to come and be amongst us, to be at the centre of all that happens here this morning. Thank you.
In our Bible reading, we were reminded that we are a living temple. And so let us pray for this community, our community, that is a living temple in this world. Lord, we thank you for the way in which you have chosen each one of us to be part of this holy house, this living temple in which your presence can be known. Lord, we think of those who are not here today, those who are unwell, those who are on holiday or visiting family. We pray that you will bless them and meet their need wherever they are today. And Lord, we pray that in the days to come, that you will help us to be a faithful witness as a community of your people. May it be clear that we are your children by the way that we live, by the words that we say, by the attitudes that we take. And so, Lord, we pray that you will continue to build us ever closer together and may we bring honour and glory to your name. For we ask it in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'm going to invite Karen to come and stand at the rostrum. We're going to do a little bit of a juggle here. I'm going to go on to head mic. Okay. So we've got a special occasion this morning. I'm going to invite... Veronica and Rachel and Joseph to come and stand next to Karen and then I'll go on this, this end. Yeah, let's all, let's all be on the same level and not make Karen <laughs> feel small by standing yeah, up on the ledge. Okay. <laughs> so, as many of you will know, Joseph, Veronica and Rachel became soldiers just over a year ago. It was while we were still in a lockdown, so it was a bit of an unusual enrolment as soldiers and since we've been able to gather for in-person worship they have been playing with our band as you all have seen week by week. So we've kind of caught up with ourselves on the admin here and we're going to make it official this morning. So we are officially welcoming Joseph as a bandsman and Rachel and Veronica as bandswomen and recognising how they are giving their musical talents to God and offering them in service through taking their place in the band. And Karen is going to present them with their commissions. Now, some of you will also be aware that Joseph and Veronica are leaving home very soon and going off to university. So we're only going to get to see them in the, in the very long holidays that university students get. So we're looking, looking forward to those coming up. But I have asked all three of them this morning to share with us one thing that they'd like us to pray for or into for them. So, I'll start with Joseph because he's nearest. Joseph, what would you like us to pray for you? Um, just settling into London. Okay, so Joseph would like us to pray for him settling in. You're going to be living in the Deptford area, which is South London, for those of you not sure. And um, getting used to the tube system, so we'll, we'll pray. <laughs> And not wanting to get lost. I don't think you can get much further out than that. No. Don't, don't ask Bram for tips, because he, he's got in a muddle before now. <laughs> he once nearly went home with my boss, because um, he just got on a train with him, because he was chatting to him on the platform, and they weren't going in the same direction at all. So don't, don't ask Bram for tips. OK, Rachel? Going back to work um, at the Special Education Needs School next week, um, and I've got a new class that are a bit challenging, so just that I can help them the way that they need, and I can hope it goes okay. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I, I know from previous chats with Rachel, some of the children at that school do have quite challenging behaviour, 
So we'll pray for Rachel in giving them the right sort of support. And Veronica? Just for the energy to keep going, really, because it's been crazy, like a void from going somewhere, doing something, and I've not had time to actually, like, breathe <laughs> for a bit. So just, um, yeah, the will to keep going and have courage and be patient and just keep striving, keep moving, really. Brilliant. Many of you will know that Veronica has been working at Glyndebourne over the summer, so she's not really had a summer holiday, have you? She's just been working and loving it, but very long days. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry of our bands, and we thank you for the way in which Joseph, Rachel and Veronica have committed to that and to using their musical skills in your service and in witness to your love. And Lord, we recognize the, the different avenues in which you are leading them. And we pray for Joseph as he moves up to the Deptford area in a couple of weeks' time. We just pray that you will be, be very close to him and that he'll be aware of your presence as he settles into university life and gets used to a new pattern of life and a new way of getting around. So we pray your blessing on Joseph as he settles into his new studies. Lord, we thank you that Rachel has chosen to serve with challenging children. We pray for her as she starts a new term with a new class. We pray that she'll quickly get to know the children and that you will guide her in how best to help and support them. And Lord, may she find fulfillment through that ministry. And Father, we thank you for Veronica and we pray that you will give her real stamina and the energy and the courage and the patience to keep going in these final weeks of work as she prepares to go to university. And Lord, I pray that you will bless Joseph, John, Veronica and Rachel in all that they do for you, that they do in your name. We pray that it will bring honour to you and that you will continue to bring blessing into their lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing. And the bands are now going to play. And very aptly, the music is called A Special Moment. The, sorry. the words are going to come up on the screen, but I think it's quite useful to highlight them sometimes. Um, so this piece, as Pam just said, is called A Special Moment, um, and it's a reflective arrangement. So the words to this are, this is God's moment, God's moment for you. A moment so solemn, yet joyous and new. Forgiven is all sinning, real life is beginning. This is God's moment for you. Thank you.
Thank you, Band, for reminding us of those words. We usually think of summer as a time to relax, perhaps to enjoy being outdoors, maybe do a bit of traveling, a time to switch off. But if we were back in Anglo-Saxon and Celtic times in this country, summer was also a time for war between Anglo-Saxon and Celtic kingdoms for a number of the same reasons, really, that it was easier to camp out in the summer, summer, easier to find food in the wild, so good time to go into battle. And if that sounds a bit antiquated, we should remember that the changing seasons were a key issue, particularly on the Eastern Front during World War II, with tanks getting bogged down in the mud in the Ukraine during winter, supplies running out, and thousands of soldiers starving to death. And right now, the military strategists are talking about the challenges that will be there for both Russia and Ukraine if the Russian invasion carries on into the winter months. Going back to that Anglo-Saxon period, there was an epic saga written called The Dream of the Rude, not R-U-D-E, R-O-O-D, which means the cross. And it depicted the cross of Jesus Christ as a battleground between Christ and evil. And it, the poem unfolds and talks about that spiritual battle that Christ fought and won for us so that we can live in the peace and the reconciliation that he died to bring. And as we heard about, in our Bible reading earlier. So we're going to think this morning briefly about three areas, three contexts, and what Christ's peace-bringing death means in those. Firstly, that of war and conflict, which is so present in our minds at the moment. Wars and conflict usually arise because of divisions, deep-seated divisions between different groups of people or even sometimes individuals. Sometimes it's about a lust for power on the part of one party and it can be focused in one person or it can be agreed for natural resources like oil, which has often been the case in the Middle East or access to seaports, as we're seeing in Ukraine at the moment. Or it might be about a false belief that one group is superior to the other, as happened with Germany in World War II, and more recently in the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. Or sometimes it can be about ideological or religious differences, as sadly happened during the Crusades. One of the things that Paul is telling us in Ephesians 2 is that the peace of Christ can reign between group, two groups of people who previously had been at odds. And that is possible because of God's work through Christ on the cross. Paul was writing to a group of Christians who were mostly non-Jewish, and who would have largely been despised by Jews as being pagans. And he was reminding them that at one time they had been the outsiders. The wall that had separated them from the insiders, the Jewish people, keeping them apart at a distance, has now been torn down through Christ's death. As Eugene Peterson translates verse 15, the Messiah started over. Instead of continuing with two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everybody. The death of Christ on the cross brings us the hope when confronted with war that those warring factions who now can only see what divides them will come to discover the way for the peace of Christ to reign and bring them together. So when we pray for peace, we pray not just for the absence of war, 
but for a path to reconciliation with justice. The second context I'd like to touch on this morning is that of cancel culture. In some quarters of the press, you can't kind of blink without reading about cancel culture. The Cambridge Dictionary defines it as a way of behaving in a society or group, especially on social media, in which it's common to reject and stop supporting someone because they've said or done something that offends you. So it's a form of boycott that silences the voices of individuals, organisations or even brands that others find offensive. And whilst it can highlight the wrongness of attitudes like sexism or racism and holds people accountable for what they say, all too often it tips over into bullying. It denies the person being cancelled the opportunity to explain what they meant or to apologise or to demonstrate that they've changed their thinking or their behaviour. And it doesn't always make the people who've been cancelled change anyhow. Often, it just helps to entrench them in their position and breeds hostility. And it can make other people afraid to say what they think for fear of being cancelled, jeopardising free speech. And so the exchange of ideas and the space for debate and dialogue and nuance is lost as people are ostracised and society gets divided into us and them. And then we end up with the opposite of what Christ's death on the cross was meant to achieve, which was the end of hostility. Forgetting that as J.B. Phillips translates verse 13, through the blood of Christ, you who were once outside the pale are with us inside the circle of God's love and purpose. So let's be incredibly careful about jumping on that bandwagon of cancel culture, which places those with whom we differ outside the pale, as Phillips puts it. Whilst there might be some voices that it's unhelpful to for us to listen to for the sake of our own well-being that we might need to unfollow on social media. Let's make sure we don't allow condemnation to creep into our hearts and take over so that we're, we end up being drawn into humiliating people with whom we disagree. Which brings us to the third context, which is our personal relationships. In Romans 12, 18, Paul says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This has to be the principle that guides our relationships with people who think or behave differently to us. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's always possible. In Ephesians 2, Paul reminds us the kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how we got here, in what he is building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. It's our security as people who belong to God, for whom Christ died, that gives us the inner strength we need to live at peace with people who have different values or behaviours or views to us. We thought three weeks ago about how we together are built into a spiritual temple, a dwelling place where God's presence is known, 
And Paul brings us back to that same picture that Peter paints. I love the way that Eugene Peterson says, we see it taking shape day after day, which reminds us that not only as individuals, but as a community, we are a work in progress. And that's true of our personal relationships as much as any other aspect of our growth in grace and faith. So what might Paul's message be saying to us about how we pray for situations of war and conflict? About how we relate to individuals or groups of people who think and behave differently to us? About how we live in peace with everyone as far as it depends on us? I invite you to reflect on those questions over the next few moments. We're going to turn together to song 603 in the Salvation Army song, but I'm going to come down to the piano. And I wasn't sure how well you would know this song, so I'm going to play you through the melody. It's one of those that kind of cycles round. So I'll play through a verse, and, um, well, it's a verse and a very short chorus, and then I invite you to start sing in, okay?
Lord Jesus, we praise you this morning for what you achieved through your death on the cross. We thank you that you have turned us from outsiders into those within the circle of God's love and purpose. And Lord, we pray that that reconciliation that you've brought between us and our Heavenly Father will flow out into our lives, that we may live reconciled with each other, at peace with each other. Lord, help us in those challenging situations in our lives with the people that it is hard to live at peace with. Lord, we pray that you will give us that inner strength and fortitude to do everything that we can to live at peace with others. We pray that you will give us grace with those whose behaviour or whose values offend us. And Lord, may we be peacemakers in your world. Guide us as we pray for those parts of our world that are torn, about, torn apart by war and conflict at this time. We pray for wisdom for our world leaders and may we be faithful in supporting them in prayer. We make our, name, our prayers in the name of Jesus, our Prince of Peace. Amen. We're going to conclude our worship with song 813, number 813. It's very short, and um, we we'll invite you to stand as we sing. Can we have it through twice, please, Luke, as it's so short? Let's stand. Jesus Christ, our Prince of Peace, who created every being that lives, who gave us differences so that we could share in the immensity of diversity found in his creation, cause you to live with one another and with others in the peace between different people groups which the saving work of his cross has made possible. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Amen.